This is a meeting being held by the International Youth and Students for Social Equality. And the title of our meeting today is The Threat of World War Looms, Take Up the Fight Against Imperialism and for International Socialism. And while it certainly is the afternoon in Australia, we have participants in Germany, the United States and elsewhere. So it is good morning, good evening uh, to you. My name is Cheryl Crisp. I'm the National Secretary of the SEP in Australia, and I'll be chairing today's meeting. To say that the world in which we live in the third decade of the 21st century is like no other is something of an understatement. For the young people in the audience today, you are at the beginning of your adult lives. Your future, which should be one of education, exploring the world, pursuing your interests, deciding careers, relationships, families, uh, is one it, or is one for which many young people uh, today is a fading dream. What faces the new young generations of the world is one of uncertainty, insecurity and danger. The last two years have been characterised by the greatest social crisis since World War I, the, world, uh, the worst pandemic for a hundred years, which has been allowed to run unchecked globally. Under conditions where man can walk on the moon, send probes to Mars, plumb the depths of the ocean and cure all manner of diseases. A virus which was both predicted and predictable has killed, according to the Lancet Medical Journal, 19 million people. In the third year of the pandemic, not only is there no end in sight, notwithstanding the media barrage that it is behind us, but because of the emergence of another variant, BA2, one which is more infectious and virulent, a new surge is unfolding. This was not preordained. It is not just a natural occurrence, but is the outcome of conscious decisions by governments in every country, really with the exception of China, who has maintained public health measures uh, themselves, which have proven even prior to vaccines that the virus can be eliminated. But of course, viruses know no borders. And unless the pandemic, which in addition to the horrific death toll, will condemn millions of people to possibly lifelong symptoms and chronic illness, uh, the pandemic itself can be fought only successfully on an international scale, mobilizing the immense resources of society to do so. And epidemiologists have estimated that with known public health measures, including lockdowns, testing, contact tracing and quarantining, as well as, of course, vaccines, the virus could be eliminated within a matter of, they predict, a couple of months. But of course, the resources of society are in the hands of the capitalist class, the tiny layer of immensely wealthy elite who are demanding that nothing impede the accumulation of wealth by inhibiting production. It is this class which all governments represent, irrespective of the political party to which they belong. And the pandemic has exposed to billions of people throughout the world, the vast majority whose lives have transformed because of the pandemic, that governments will not adopt policies to protect the health and well-being of the populations. And that has also been revealed in the course of the bushfires in Australia in 2019, 2020, and the floods that we are still experiencing here. And it is under those conditions that the war in Ukraine has erupted. The war which was initially, which was initiated by the invasion of Russia, but stoked and provoked by US imperialism and NATO. It raises the danger of world war, uh, and that between and involving nuclear armed powers to a level not seen since the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962. This is the war which Biden and the Democratic administration wanted and has planned for. And there are two interrelated reasons. It is of course bound up with the long held aims of US imperialism since the dissolution of the Soviet Union in 1991 to plunder and dismember Russia 
render it a vassal state as the means of overcoming the loss of world hegemony by the US and to establish the most favorable conditions for the drive, and I mean war drive, against China, a country which is seen as the main economic threat to US imperialism. And almost as importantly are the domestic reasons behind this war, which is being used as a diversion at home to the catastrophic situation which the pandemic and the social conditions of millions in America, of Americans face. It is used to externalize the enemy, to divert attention from the role of the United States and its government, who are in fact the real enemy of the American people. The International Committee of the Fourth International opposes the invasion by the Russian army. This was a reckless and bankrupt attempt to resolve the deepening crisis opened up by the dissolution of the USSR in 1991 at the hands of the Stalinist bureaucracy. Putin's actions have both played into the hands of the Biden administration, but more importantly created immense confusion and disorientation amongst millions of people internationally. Only the international working class can prevent the descent into barbarism, which is what confronts mankind today. The ICFI stands alone in fighting to unite the working class in every country in an anti-war movement based on a socialist perspective. In doing so, we follow the example of Lenin and those handful of socialists who met in the Zimmerwald Conference of 1915 to organize an anti-war movement to the slaughter which was raging throughout Europe in World War I. They were at that time a tiny minority, but they proved to be the most far-sighted, the most correct expression of the underlying interests of the working class. The eruption of a mass anti-war movement which culminated in its most conscious and powerful expression in the Russian Revolution of 1917 is what ended World War I. It was not the appeals for peace from pacifists or the negotiations of warring parties which ended the war, but the fear of capitalist governments internationally that the same revolutionary struggles would develop in their own countries, in Britain, Germany, France, and elsewhere. And the same exists today. There is no constituency in the ruling class for a resolution to this crisis. In fact, the demands in the United States are reaching fever pitch to intervene militarily. Germany, as Gregor from the SEP in, in, uh, in our, SE, uh, our section of, in Germany, uh, the SEP will outline has seized on the war to dispense with all the post-World War II apologies for the Third Reich. The Australian government has announced on a virtually daily basis, increased military spending. But there is really no mass support in the working class for this war. There is deep suspicion and dread at what could erupt from it. But an anti-war movement, and we have to be clear on this, is not an anti-Russian movement, as we have seen in Europe and in sections of the United States. An anti-war movement does not call for the assassination of the leader of the so-called enemy state. It does not call for increased military commitments and spending. It does not call for no-fly zones, which would lead to wider and more dangerous war. A real anti-war movement fights for the unity of the working class internationally. And it stands in opposition to its own ruling class. So in that respect, it is only the protests which have developed in Russia that have opposed Putin's invasion uh, and attack on, on Ukraine, which so far really meets the criteria of a real anti-war movement. And such an anti-war movement has to be by nature anti-capitalist and international because there is no constituency within capitalism that will fight against 
such a war. So it must be a socialist movement. And it is only the international committee which fights for that perspective. And it's that perspective that we will discuss today. We will have three speakers and they are all members of the International Youth and Students for Social Equality. And uh, they will be speaking on different aspects of the objective conditions and the tasks which confront both young people and the working class. Our first speaker is Evram Yazgin. Evram joined the SEP in 2016, and he is a national a committee member of the SEP and leads the IYSSE in Melbourne and is the president of the University of Melbourne IYSSE branch. He writes for the World Socialist website on the situation in Australia, including the social crisis confronting young people. And he will discuss uh, the relationship of the situation internationally to that which confronts uh, ordinary people and workers in this country. So please give him a very warm welcome. Thank you, Cheryl. Uh, the world teeters on the precipice of a catastrophic war triggered by the unfolding crisis in Ukraine, Cheryl has gone through. Behind the backs of the population, Australia is being placed on front lines. The entire Australian political and corporate media establishment has lined up behind US NATO warmongering in Eastern Europe against Russia and US imperialist war plans in this region against China. For the ruling capitalist class, war abroad means war against the working class at home. War is used to justify stepped up anti-democratic and authoritarian measures, as well as accelerating the decimation of social conditions for ordinary workers and their families. A stark expression of this is seen in this country. In the last 30 months alone, Australia has seen the 2019 to 2020 bushfire catastrophe, the ongoing and deepening misery brought about amid the COVID-19 pandemic, and most recently, the floods causing havoc across the eastern states. In every case, the bourgeoisie claims nothing can be done and that these are freak accidents. But the truth is that this social devastation is the byproduct of the conscious profit driven policies of the capitalist class in Australia and in every country. The floods that have shattered communities in Queensland and New South Wales these last few weeks have demonstrated the indifference of governments for the health, lives and livelihoods of ordinary people. The death toll from the floods reached 20 this week, with tens of thousands of people forced to evacuate their homes, with more storms and flooding being predicted. Homes destroyed or severely damaged are mainly in poor and working class areas where most residents are not insured because of the exorbitant costs of premiums or the refusal of insurance giants to cover flood damage. On Wednesday, Prime Minister Scott Morrison visited Northern New South Wales working class town Bismal, which has been devastated by flooding. His visit summed up the government's contempt for ordinary people and fear of mounting popular anger. Lismore provides a snapshot of the tragic consequences of capitalism's inhuman indifference to the plight of the working class. With a population of 44,000, residents in Lismore and surrounding areas have been hit by food and water shortages since the floods. Two thirds of Lismore properties that were inundated are now uninhabitable. Thousands are now effectively homeless. The government response was non-existent leaving residents to rescue one another and organize the recovery effort among themselves. Despite being flood prone, Lismore was excluded from priority access to federal flood mitigation funding last year. During Morrison's Lismore visit, one reporter sharply outlined the tragedy of the floods. They noted that residents, that if residents had not rescued one another, there would have been hundreds or even thousands of people dead. Who should people blame? The reporter asked. Not the government, Morrison insisted, contemptuously declaring, quote, in any natural disaster, we don't have those resources that are just waiting around the corner, end quote. 
Morrison more or less stated that people are on their own in disasters. He said, quote, the suggestion that it is only the governments that are involved in an emergency response, I don't think the community agrees with that, end quote. Now, revolting as Morrison's comments are, he speaks for an entire political establishment, including the Labour Party and Greens, which defends the capitalist order, which views the lives and livelihoods of the working class as negligible compared to the profit interests of the financial oligarchy. As the Socialist Equality Party parent organization of the IYSSC explained in a recent statement published on the World Socialist website, quote, every aspect of the floods crisis from the lack of preparation and warnings to people to the inadequacy of basic infrastructure and support services and the lack of assistance offered to the hundreds of thousands of flood victims is the direct result of the subordination of society to the dictates of private profit. The government has pledged just $25 million for emergency relief. Just 4.7 million was provided to primary health providers in the area and a pitiful $800,000 to extend a small business support package. The day after outlining a pittance for flood victims, Morrison unveiled the largest increase to the defense force since the Vietnam War, a $38 billion expansion of the number of uh, ADF personnel from around 60,000 to 80,000 over the next 20 years. Signaling Labor's bipartisan support for Australian militarism and involvement in US-led wars, opposition leader Anthony Albanese responded the same morning, pledging to spend more than 2% of Australia's GDP on defence should Labor win the upcoming federal election. The cry from the corporate elite is guns not butter, as highlighted by a recent op-ed in the Australian Financial Review. The article concludes that, quote, complacent priorities no longer match the strategic challenge when hard guns versus butter choices are needed. And Australia must choose to get its reform act together to help pay for a bigger defense deterrence, end quote. In other words, limitless funds for war abroad, but nothing for working people at home. While flood victims are given crumbs at the drop of a hat, the Australian government has used fraudulent humanitarian claims to justify sending $70 million in military aid to the right-wing US-backed government in Ukraine in the war against Russia. And while the crisis in Europe, Eastern Europe continues to unfold, the US administration of President Biden has heightened the aggressive US confrontation with China, which can be traced to the pivot to Asia initiated by the Obama administration. The pivot, a massive US military buildup in the Asia Pacific, was announced on the floor of Australian Parliament in 2011. As many youth struggle to find work amid the rising cost of living, economic conscription, as is seen in countries like the US, will be used to herd thousands, if not tens of thousands, of young Australians into the military to fight in imperialist wars. But growing militarism is also aimed at turning increasing social tensions outward. Around the world, governments are coming up against growing opposition from workers and youth to the brutality of everyday life under capitalism. Once hailed as success stories amid the COVID-19 pandemic due to low deaths and infections compared to other countries, Australia and New Zealand have seen skyrocketing case numbers and deaths. The homicidal let it rip policies of the Australian ruling elite, promoted by all the major political parties and the mainstream media, are echoed by governments around the world. On the front lines of this murderous policy are young people. Youth occupy many of the jobs which place them at the highest risk of contracting COVID, such as in hospitality, retail, and delivery services. School kids and university students are forced back into unsafe classrooms and lecture theaters. Here, they are at risk of being infected, spreading the virus among their classmates, teachers, family, and the broader community. Far from being in no danger, children and young people are getting sick from COVID, with many suffering the effects of long COVID months after initial infection. 
The situation is starkest in the United States, where, according to official figures, one million have now died from COVID since the start of, pandem start of the pandemic. It is under these conditions that the ruling elite in the US and other imperialist countries are turning to war to deflect rising social discontent and enact its geostrategic aims. Capitalism has brought young people face to face with one existential crisis after another, presenting us with a rather bleak future. The threat of world war, growing poverty, the danger of fascism, climate change, and the pandemic are all the result of capitalist barbarism. So what is the way forward? Any conception that you can rely on, uh, appeal to, or pressure capitalist governments to stop war or end social miser misery is a political dead end. We need a new perspective. Young people must turn to the world's working the only social force capable of ending capitalism and hence ending the war and social misery that it brings. We must reject all attempts to divide workers on the basis of nationality. The IYSSC, as the youth and student movement of the World Trotskyist Party of Socialist Revolution, fights for an independent internationalist perspective for the working class and youth. The IYSSC is fighting and will continue to fight to build a socialist anti-war movement among youth and students. Only armed with this perspective can the world working class reorganize society and build an egalitarian world free from war, poverty, and social and environmental degradation. I urge you, join this struggle today. There is no time to lose. Join and help build the IYCC. Thank you. Thanks, Evram. Also, I'd, I'd like to welcome the high school students, university students, young people, young workers who are uh, in our meeting today. I, I'm very pleased that, that you've been able to attend. And I particularly invite you at the uh, conclusion of, of our contributions to ask questions. Because I think that the points that Evram has raised in his um, uh, remarks really do highlight that no aspect of life, there is not uh, an area of life which uh, is, is now being uh, dealt with, is being assisted, uh, uh, um, responded to by, uh, by the government as Scott Morrison said, it's just getting hard to live in Australia. Of course, the question is who's making it hard? Um, that's an issue which uh, increasingly uh, it is becoming very clear. But of course, this isn't a, a, an Australian phenomena at all. Um, and to speak on the very uh, important developments which uh, have emerged within Germany and our section, the SEP in Germany, has followed the development of uh, the far right wing. Um, and most importantly, the fact that that far right wing is very much part of the political establishment, certainly the state apparatus within uh, Germany, and who have responded immediately uh, to the war in the Ukraine uh, to reprise their long held, um, possibly kept quiet, uh, designs and perspective for, uh, for their own expansion. So our next speaker is uh, Gregor Link. <clears throat> Gregor is a leading member of the IYSSE in Germany. He writes for the World Socialist website about uh, the buildup of German militarism, the development of social inequality in that country, and the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, which is now once again uh, surging to unheard of levels. Uh, Gregor joined the ICFI in response to the war in Syria, the international rise of the far right and the efforts to falsify history in order to escalate German militarism. We are extremely pleased that uh, Gregor can speak at our meeting. It's very early in the morning and so we do thank him and, uh, and on your behalf, give him a very warm welcome. Thank you, Gregor. Thank you very much, uh, Cheryl, and um, good, good afternoon, everyone. 
Um, I'm very honored to speak to you today um, on behalf of the IYSSE in Germany. I would like to stress the importance of this international meeting. I would also just at the beginning like to express my solidarity with the fight waged by the Australian section of the ICFI against the anti-democratic registration laws that aim at banning any opposition against the government's drive towards imperialist war. These bans are an expression of the fact that the ruling classes fear the development of a conscious socialist opposition in the working class against war, social inequality, and deliberate mass contagion with COVID-19. What they fear most is the SEP's struggle in the working class, a struggle which embodies the anti-war program of socialist internationalism, the program of Leon Trotsky, Vladimir Lenin, and Rosa Luxemburg, as they fought to mobilize the working class ahead of the war. This vindicates the struggle of the ICFI and the IYSSE, but it is also a warning that must be taken seriously, as it points to the total breakdown of democratic forms of rule under conditions where inequality, militarism, and preventable death amid the pandemic make them more and more untenable for the ruling class. Conditions today resemble nothing so much so much as the political crisis before World War I and World War II. The malignant capitalist contradictions that led to war today unfold again on a much higher level. While the Russian invasion of Ukraine must be unequivocally opposed from the standpoint of socialist internationalism, the emerging war is rapidly assuming the form of a catastrophic confrontation between nuclear armed Russia and the imperialist powers of the North Atlantic Alliance. As we speak, the NATO powers conduct this non-declared war ever more aggressively, flooding Ukraine's military with weapons, seizing Russian assets and strangling its economy and deploying thousands of troops to Russia's borders. A fierce anti-Russian campaign has been unleashed in European science, media, and culture, basing itself on privileged sections of the middle class and fueled by the imperialist war interests of the ruling classes. In British, German, and Polish cities, performances of works by Tchaikovsky are canceled. Acclaimed artists such as conductor Valery Gergiev and soprano Anna Netrebko are targeted for removal. In Italy, cities like Milan and Florence are considering the removal of university courses and even statues dealing with Dostoevsky. The German academic establishment has gone a step further and effectively severed all official links to Russian research and science institutions, halting all bilateral projects, ending academic exchange, freezing funds, and in some cases, even barring Russian scientists and students from entering the country. It is an unprecedented step not even undertaken during the height of the Cold War era. But the most ominous development in current capitalist politics in Europe is the unanimous and breathtaking decision of the German ruling class to dispense with all post-war constraints on militarism. In a sweeping decision taken just hours after the Russian intervention began and applauded by all the established parties in parliament, Social Democratic Chancellor Olaf Scholz, whom you can see here, announced the tripling of military spending for this year, even pledging to enshrine special funds for the military in the constitution. The federal government's decision to provide 100 billion euro or 150 billion Australian dollars additionally for the armed forces makes Germany Europe's strongest military power overnight. It is the greatest rearmament since Hitler, and it is being pushed through by a coalition of social democrats, greens, and right-wing liberals. The 100 billion euro bazooka as it was called by news magazine Der Spiegel, is being framed as a reaction to the Russian invasion of Ukraine, 
but in fact, it was prepared and decided upon as early as October when the new coalition government was formed. The preparations for Germany's new foreign policy epoch, as they call it, date back even further, when in 2014, leading politicians declared that Germany could no longer, quote, stand on the sidelines in military conflicts all over the world. Just days after these declarations in 2014, Berlin joined Washington in orchestrating a coup in Ukraine, which forced out the elected pro-Russian president and brought to power the extreme right-wing forces which now have gained dominant influence in the country. The IYSSE and the SGP have been fighting against this militarist conspiracy in the German state apparatus since its inception. We have exposed the deeply unpopular aims for world power, and we have explained the significance of these aims among workers and youth. These imperialist aims were associated with the campaign at the universities to falsify history and whitewash German crimes in two world wars in order to prepare for new historic crimes. One cannot understand what is happening today in Europe and in Germany especially without studying the fight of the ICFI and the IYSE against the return of German great power, ambitions and militarism. I want to warmly recommend the book, Why Are They Back? by Christoph van Dreyer, which has been written on these questions. Because the historical questions raised by current events are immense. The Nazis' war of extermination against the Soviet Union killed 27 million Soviet people and went hand in glove with the industrialized murder of six, six million people of Jewish belief in the Holocaust. Unspeakable war crimes were committed by Gestapo officers and SS shock troopers in Poland, Yugoslavia, Ukraine, and Soviet Russia. 80 years later, the machinery of German imperialism is moving once again toward Russia over the fields of Ukraine. German weapons are again being used to kill Russian soldiers. The NATO powers are arming Ukrainian fascist militias to do their dirty work, sacrificing the Ukrainian populations as pawns in their plan for regime change in the Kremlin, the breakup of Russia and Western hegemony over Eurasia. The fascist militias that receive NATO's weapons view themselves as the political heroes of the Ukrainian nationalist forces that back then collaborated with German imperialism and with British and US imperialism after the war had ended. One really has to grasp the implications of this. The same political forces that collaborated with the Nazis in the war of extermination are now again being armed and supported by Western imperialism in a war against Russia with devastating consequences for the working class in Ukraine, Russia, and the entire region and the globe. The shares of German defense companies are already skyrocketing. Last month, shares of tank manufacturer Rheinmetall and machine gun producer Heckler & Koch each rose by almost 59%. Both companies are also suppliers to the Australian armed forces, and uh, Rheinmetall recently presented a state-of-the-art autonomous combat vehicle developed in cooperation with the Australian Departments of Defense and Economic Affairs, as well as universities QUT in Queensland and RMIT. The almost unfathomable amounts of money that are currently pumped into the military and into the financial markets are to be extracted again from the working class. The ruling Senate of the German capital, Berlin, which consists of a coalition of Social Democrats, Greens, and the so-called Left Party, has already decided to cut spending for many public schools this year by as much as 90%. Inflation is at 5% and prices of food have gone up the same amount in February alone. In the last nine days, fuel prices have gone up by 40% and the average price of heating oil has more than doubled. 
The Socialist Equality Party in Germany is anticipating and preparing for a revolutionary eruption of the class struggle in Germany and across Europe. And we are fighting to arm the struggle with a socialist and international perspective. After more than two years of a murderous pandemic policy, with all its medical, social and economic devastation and unprecedented profiteering, workers are not going to simply accept that millions more are to be sacrificed in a war that threatens the destruction of human culture as a whole. Just to give you some insight into what happened during the pandemic, officially 125 thousand people have died of COVID in Germany, a number that may well be much, much larger. It would be equivalent to roughly 40,000 dead in Australia or 1.5 in thousand. The German ruling class is profiting heavily off the production of vaccines, flat out rejecting all demands to release the patents so that all countries could produce them. During the pandemic, the 10 richest Germans have almost doubled their wealth, and this increase alone corresponds to the net wealth of the bottom 40%, some 33 million people. The policy of the German government, which is mirrored on state level by all bourgeois parties, from the far right to the pseudo left, is one of deliberate, conscious and meticulously planned contagion. The main credo of the ruling class in Germany has always been the medical system must not collapse. Everything below that is deemed acceptable, even if it means using the military to cope with the rising waves of death. Doctors and medical workers have been working ceaselessly at their limit since the beginning of the pandemic, healing the sick and burying the dead. Even so, funds for public health were slashed amid the pandemic and hundreds of hospitals closed due to their lack of profitability. Currently, between 200 and 300 people are dying of COVID in Germany every single day because of the government's refusal to prevent the spread of Omicron. The spread of COVID-19 is as intense as never before. The more contagious and dangerous Omicron subvariant BA2 already accounts for 48% of all new COVID cases. On 20th of March, the federal government is planning for Freedom Day, outlawing lockdowns and canceling mask mandates in schools and public life. The IYSSE and the Socialist Equality Party have received strong and growing support in our fight for the building of an international anti-war movement in the working class and for the construction of rank and file committees at workplaces and schools to unify workers and youth across all artificial barriers and boundaries. This is being done in direct opposition to the nationalist apparatus of the trade union bureaucracy. Just yesterday, we reported on a joint statement by the main industrial union and the Industrial Employers Association backing the crippling sanctions against Russia. The German Trade Union Confederation speaking for all main trade unions, declared its support for, quote, the government's decision on defense policy, meaning the largest rearmament since Hitler and the weapons deliveries to Ukraine. While the unions are closing the ranks with the corporations and the capitalist government, they actively work to reduce workers' wages and living standards, pitting workers in different countries and plants against each other. The most striking example is the bidding competition at Ford, where the works councils of Saar Louis in Germany and Valencia in Spain try to outdo each other with proposals to management about how to slash benefits and wages in order to maximize profits. This has been met with the initiation of a rank and file committee of workers at Ford, assisted by the SGP. Our struggle in the working class has found its most significant expression in the growing support for our legal campaign against the domestic intelligence services surveillance of our party. A petition which we have launched as a public statement of opposition against this anti-democratic attack has received more than 10,000 signatures. 
the statement declares that the surveillance of the SGP is an attack on all left-wing and progressive thought and can be used to equally target striking workers, scientists that analyze social inequality, or even booksellers um, selling Marxist literature. The attack shows that the German ruling elites fear the program of revolutionary socialism, just as the Australian ruling elites do. They are prepared to attempt to ban revolutionary socialism for the third time, as they have done during the imperial era before the First World War, and as they have done before the Second World War, spearheaded by the Nazis. Yet, in our party statement, we make the following point that applies both to the SGP in Germany and to the SEP in Australia. 2022 is not 1933. The anti-democratic measures are not taken following massive defeats of the working class, but under conditions of a growing radicalization in Europe, uh, of a growing radicalization. In Europe, Australia, and around the world, a new mass movement of the working class is developing to fight back against deliberate mass infection, war, and inequality. Under these conditions, it becomes crucial to defend and build up the SGP and the AC and the SEP. Thanks, Gregor. That was, uh, that was really very uh, enlightening. I think there will be many, many questions that uh, uh, will flow from, uh, from your contribution. So I, I, I thank you very much. <clears throat> Our next and final speaker is uh, someone for whom you are all familiar, uh, Oscar Grenfell. Oscar, as you know, is a National Committee member of the SEP. He joined the party in 2007 and is the national convener of the IYSSE in Australia. Uh, he writes extensively for the World Socialist website on the political situation, uh, social conditions facing young people and the working class in this country and in this region. And Oscar also plays a leading role uh, internationally in the defence of Julian Assange and has also written extensively on that fight and that uh, very uh, decisive and principled struggle to uh, release an Australian citizen from the grip of, of at the moment, British imperialism and, uh, and, and if they got their way, US imperialism. Uh, so I would uh, very much welcome Oscar. He, as I said, he's the final speaker, after which we will open up for any questions. So please give him a warm welcome, if you could. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Comrade Cheryl. And I'd, I'd also like to welcome everyone uh, to this meeting, which is occurring under truly uh, extraordinary conditions. The outbreak of war in Europe has shocked masses of people around the world. There's a widespread sense that the war has arisen out of a profoundly sick society. There's deep going suspicion of the US NATO and their allies, and a correct fear that the development centered in Ukraine could rapidly spiral into a nuclear world war. The crucial issue under these conditions is how workers and young people can fight against war and put an end to the immense dangers of a global conflagration. In other words, the need for an alternative political perspective for the working class is directly posed as a life and death question of the utmost urgency. Such a perspective can only be developed and grasped based on an understanding of how the war threat has arisen, its relationship to antecedent developments and its fundamental driving forces. Everything is being done by the ruling elite to prevent such a careful historical consideration and assessment. What's provided by the governments and the media is not analysis, but really the crudest war propaganda. Putin is a madman or the new Hitler, the term used to describe every political leader in the crosshairs of US imperialism, from Saddam Hussein to Serbia's Slobodan Milosevic and Libya's Muammar Gaddafi. The media presents the Ukraine crisis as though it began merely a fortnight ago with no connection to prior developments. No mention is made of the neo-colonial wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, the broader record of the imperialist powers, or their ratcheting up of tensions with Russia and China over the course of the past decade. Outlining the Marxist analysis of the war 
developed by our movement alone. David North, the chairman of the WSWS International Editorial Board, made a really critical point at an international webinar on February uh, the 26th. I'll just quote it. He explained, quote, in determining one's attitude to a given war, there is no approach more politically and intellectually bankrupt than that which focuses and obsesses on the question who fired the first shot. This question abstracts a single incident from the vast complex of interacting economic, political, social and geostrategic interests and circumstances with deep historical roots and operating on a global scale that suddenly obtain the political equivalent of critical mass and trigger the eruption of military violence. Now to explain is not to justify. As comrades have said, we unequivocally oppose the Russian invasion of Ukraine, but we do so not from the standpoint of the utterly hypocritical moralism emanating from the war criminals in Washington, Berlin, London, and Canberra. Our opposition to the Russian intervention is based on the principles of socialist internationalism and the fight to unify Ukrainian Russian workers together with their class brothers and sisters internationally. It must be stated that this conflict has been stoked, instigated and prepared by the US and NATO. Putin, basing himself on reactionary Russian nationalism and the interests of its capitalist class, has walked into a trap laid by Biden and his US predecessors. We made the critical point recently that the fundamental nature of a war is revealed not by how it started, but by how it develops. And it's taken less than two weeks for this conflict to be revealed as a war between the US and NATO on the one side and Russia on the other. As we've warned, Ukraine is only the initial physical battleground of a much larger conflict. Every day, the NATO powers are flooding Ukraine's right-wing government and its military with vast weapons shipments to be used against Russian troops. At least 17,000 anti-tank missiles and 2,000 Stinger anti-aircraft missiles have already arrived uh, in the last week and a half. The US Congress yesterday approved the $13.6 billion aid package, at least half of it directly military. The Australian government, uh, with the full support of Labor, is participating. They're sending 70 million uh, in military aid under conditions in which flood victims here are given almost nothing. NATO troops are massing in Eastern Europe with at least 14,500 already present in the countries bordering Ukraine. The entire official discussion is on how this war can be escalated. Congress, together with European powers, is discussing whether or not to impose a no-fly zone over Ukraine, even as they acknowledge that this would mean a direct war with Russia. And they've already deployed what has been described as a financial nuclear weapon in the form of sanctions that have never been imposed before on a country the size of Russia. The clear aim is to shut Russia out of the international banking system and crash the ruble to create a major internal crisis. I think the sharpest expression uh, is on the political front. Biden has effectively closed diplomatic channels with Russia, something that was never done even at the height of the Cold War. And the atmosphere that's being ripped up, including in this country, is one that hasn't been seen in 80 years. Russian athletes and musicians are being denounced and hounded in, race, in a racist campaign that recalls the roundups of any enemy aliens in the two world wars. Any product or entity, even remotely associated with Russia, is coming under fire. The campaign found a particularly sinister expression this week with the revelation that Facebook is relaxing its hate speech laws. Calls for Russians and Russian leaders to be killed are now permitted on Facebook from several Eastern European countries. I think it's clear that such an explosion of militarism doesn't emerge as a result of events spanning a few weeks. There must be deeper roots. And I think what we've explained is that this eruption uh, is fundamentally the product of two interrelated factors. Firstly, the unprecedented crisis of world capitalism brought to a new peak of intensity by the pandemic. And secondly, three decades of imperialist war led by the US. 
the end of the Soviet Union in 1991 was a key turning point. In its final crime against the working class, the Stalinist bureaucracy liquidated all of the remaining gains of the 1917 Russian Revolution. As they were looting the former state assets, transforming themselves into oligarchs and dividing the USSR up into a host of separate republics, the Stalinist bureaucrats derided any references to imperialism. That was all of the past, and they insisted that the restoration of capitalism would mark a new phase of peaceful and prosperous development. What occurred was that the restoration uh, of capitalism created a massive social crisis. And contrary to the claims of Gorbachev and co, the fundamental laws of imperialism identified by Vladimir Lenin decades before remained in full force. The same processes of globalization that had rendered the Stalinist bureaucracy's nationalist program of supposed socialist, socialism in one country completely unviable were also further undermining the world standing of American capitalism. The US ruling elite turned to a program of permanent war aimed at offsetting its economic decline through the use of its overwhelming military might. With the absence of the Soviet Union to provide any restraint, US strategists proclaimed a unipolar moment. The Pentagon spelt this out in a 1992 strategy document, which stated that the US policy was, quote, to discourage advanced industrial nations from challenging our leadership or even aspiring to a larger regional or global role. In 1997, US National Security Advisor Zbigniew Brzezinski explained that the decisive issue was control over Eurasia, that is the vast landmass that stretches from Western Europe to China and that includes the Middle East, Central Asia, Russia and the Indian subcontinent. Brzezinski wrote, quote, America's global primacy is directly dependent on how long and how effectively its preponderance on the Eurasian continent is sustained, end quote. How has this strategy been implemented or through one in, uh, criminal neo-colonial war after the other? The 1991 Gulf War, the dismemberment of Yugoslavia in the late 90s, the illegal invasions of Afghanistan and Iraq, and the CIA regime change operations more recently in Syria and Libya. None of these have been purely Middle Eastern or North African interventions. They have been links in a chain aimed at advancing the overarching strategy spelt out by the Pentagon in 1992. Hand in hand with these wars, NATO has expanded its borders 800 miles east of Germany in the past 30 years directly encircling Russia with advanced weapon systems and client regimes of the US. As you can see, hopefully from this map, uh, Ukraine and Belarus are two of a handful of Eastern European countries yet to have joined NATO. And since 2011, the US uh, has openly prepared for war with China in a vast military buildup throughout the Asia Pacific that Australia is centrally involved in. The US national security strategy 2017 spelt this out very bluntly, said that the focus was now on a great power conflict. The US views China as its principal economic threat. In order to wage war on China, key sections of the American foreign policy establishment insist that it's necessary to first neutralize Russia. This would be done by breaking Russia up into a series of smaller countries uh, and installing puppet regimes. I want to quickly point to two key expressions uh, of these processes in Ukraine, one of which was uh, referenced by Gregor. As he raised in 2014, the democratically elected government of Viktor Yanukovych delayed the signing of an agreement with the European Union for greater integration uh, of Ukraine into the EU. The US and Germany reacted with hostility, viewing the move as an indication that Yanukovych was leaning towards Russia. They rapidly moved to destabilize his government with shock, to, shock troops uh, provided by fascist Ukrainian groups. US Assist Assistant Secretary of State for European and Eurasian Affairs, Victoria Norland, uh, walked the streets of Kiev, handing out cookies 
to the neo-Nazis. You should be able to see a photo of that. And in a leaked phone call, uh, she was heard discussing which corrupt oligarch would be selected to replace Yanukovych as president. All the talk about Ukrainian uh, democracy. This was a regime installed uh, directly by the US, Germany and the imperialist powers. The coup uh, brought to power a US-aligned government full of fascists, and it effectively established a NATO state on Russia's border in all but name. The other more recent development I wanted to refer to was the signing last November of a US-Ukrainian strategic partnership. Now, this document, uh, never mentioned in the official coverage of the conflict, was a virtual declaration of war against Russia by the US and Ukraine. It dispensed with the language of diplomacy, pledging to, quote, hold Russia accountable for aggression and violations of international law and its continuing malign behaviour. The Biden administration said that it intends to support Ukraine's efforts to counter armed aggression, including in the war that had been underway since 2014 between the US-backed government in Kiev and pro-Russian separatists. The strategy endorsed Quote, Ukraine's efforts to maximise its status as a NATO-enhanced opportunities partner to promote interoperability. Putin responded to this by demanding a security guarantee that Ukraine would not be brought into NATO, saying that this was Russia's red line. That demand was repeatedly rejected by Biden in the lead up to the Russian invasion. Why was it that the US took such a step, which was clearly aimed at provoking a war, as comrades have said, one of the central motivations is to divert the immense social tensions in all of the imperialist countries outwards and to paper over massive class antagonisms through a war-based national unity. This escalation has occurred amid a pandemic in which capitalist governments everywhere, including in the US, Russia and here, have sacrificed health and millions of lives on the altar of corporate profit. The billionaires have made more money in the past two years than ever before in history as they've been handed trillions of dollars in public funds. Inflation is growing rapidly in every country, including here, accelerating a wave of working class struggle. Increasingly, the world resembles the 1930s. In a perspective article this week, David North quoted comments made by Leon Trotsky in 1939. Trotsky, banished from the Soviet Union by the Stalinist bureaucracy, was leading our world party, the Fourth International, from exile in Mexico. There, he told a group of journalists, quote, the capitalist system is in a state of impasse. From my side, I do not see any normal, legal, peaceful outcome of this impasse. The outcome can only be created by a tremendous historic explosion. Historic explosions are of two kinds wars and revolutions. I believe we will have both. All of the governments and the established parties were being overwhelmed by events, Trotsky said. He compared their actions to, quote, child's play on the sloping side of a volcano before an eruption. As David North explained, Trotsky's description of the period just weeks before the outbreak of World War II applies with full force today. Capitalism is tobogganing towards disaster the ruling elite has no answer, but war abroad and a war against the working class at home. However, the same contradictions of capitalism that lead to war also propel the working class into major social struggles. The enormous crisis of all of these governments, whether it's Biden in the, Biden in the US, Johnson in Britain or Morrison here, is an expression of the social opposition that already exists. But this developing movement requires a perspective. What, what, what we're fighting for is to unite Ukrainian and Russian workers and workers everywhere in a new international anti-war movement. In 2016, our World Party published a statement entitled Socialism and the Fight Against War, which elaborated the basic principles of such an anti-war movement. To quickly summarize, it stated, the struggle against war must be based on the working class, the great revolutionary force in society, uniting behind it all progressive elements in the population. The new anti-war movement must be anti-capitalist and socialist. It must above all be international, mobilizing the vast power of the working class in a unified global struggle against imperialism. 
And finally, the new anti-war movement must be completely and unequivocally independent of and hostile to all political parties and organisations of the capitalist class. In other words, building such a movement means a political fight. In this country, there's not a sliver, sliver of difference between Labor and the Liberal Nationals on any issue from war to the let it rip COVID policies and the abandonment of flood victims. The Greens have dispensed with any nominal posturing against war. They've cheered on the government's sanctions against Russia and they've said nothing about the US NATO aggression. A particularly pernicious role is played by what we term the pseudo left, groups such as Socialist Alliance and Socialist Alternative in this country. What are their basic positions in the current war crisis? They blame Russia for everything, covering up for the US and NATO and lining up behind them. They call for full support for the right-wing Ukrainian government and they confuse, falsify and distort the historical developments outside of which the current events cannot be understood. And most strikingly, these pseudo left groups say nothing whatsoever about the working class. For them, it has no role to play whatsoever. Their only perspective, aside from backing uh, the Ukrainian regime, a US proxy, is to appeal to the major powers to settle their issues at the diplomatic table. Nothing could be more complacent or more clearly designed to chloroform workers and young people as to the immense dangers that they face. The positions of the pseudo left are not a mistake. These groups split from the Trotskyist movement more than 60 years ago, rejecting its fight for the political independence of the working class and turning to the Stalinist and social democratic parties and various bourgeois nationalist regimes. Today, they're parties of the affluent upper middle class, which forms a privileged constituency for imperialism. They've got nothing to do with socialism or the working class, and in fact, they're hostile to both. Our World Party alone bases itself on the whole heritage of the fight by the Marxist movement against imperialist war. As the great uh, German revolutionary Karl Liebknecht insisted during World War I, the main enemy of the working class is at home. The task of socialists is to mobilize the great power of the working class against its own government and the capitalist system in a struggle for world socialist revolution. That's the only means of ending and preventing war. The correctness of this was proven in the 1917 Russian Revolution, which ignited revolutionary struggles throughout Europe and forced the end of the World War. What was unique in Russia was the presence of the Bolshevik Party, a revolutionary party rooted in the working class and based on an internationalist perspective. Its leaders, Vladimir Lenin and Leon Trotsky, had waged an implacable struggle against all of the national opportunists who supported the war effort of their own government and support, sought to subordinate the working class to it. This is how they elaborated and fought for a revolutionary alternative to war, not just in Russia or in one region, but for the international working class. This is the perspective that we fight for today and that has to be taken up. I urge everyone who's not yet involved to become active in the IYSC, apply to join the SEP uh, and take your place in this fight. Thanks very much. Thanks, uh, thanks very much, Oscar. Um, my delay is that there are there's so many comments and questions that uh, I'm trying to, to establish the best way that we can address as many as possible. And we will, uh, and I will be calling upon our comrades in the audience or some of the comrades in the audience to assist. Um, I think, however, as uh, there has been a lot of of questions raised, and I will read them out um, or read out the ones that, that we've got at the moment. <clears throat> then I will uh, show you so at least two of the, um, the books, the literature that we have uh, on, uh, on sale today. Um, and then we'll, we'll start the answering of the question. So the first question, uh, from Xinping is what difference is is but what is the difference between pandemic and epidemic and possibly it may mean endemic um, two kids kids have to wear masks to school right now uh, then 
it goes on. Uh, Jason asks, the Russian Revolution ended World War I. Could I have a reference for that? Uh, then uh, uh, Jason asks another question. Where is COVID causing terrible trouble? Not in New South Wales, I think. Uh, Roman asks, do you think you do you think Ukraine's defense should be supported as much as possible? Another question, do kids go to school now or having online classes? Then back to the questions of Ukraine. Do you think Ukraine's defense should be supported as much as possible? Well, the war is happening, so what should be done now? So we should let Russia annex Ukraine, that's a question. Uh, Jason then asks, so the solution would have been deny any possibility of Ukraine joining NATO. Roman asks, shouldn't Ukraine be able to decide whether it wants to join NATO and not Russia? Uh, Tim Lan asks, shouldn't Ukrainian and Russian people decide whether they should have war instead of their governments, which fed them with nationalist propagandas. Uh, Zimpeng, uh, so because of the situation now, Ukraine may not attend NATO. And that's a question. Uh, then there's a comment from uh, Tim Lan, who says it's never... Now, the reason I'm reading them all together is they are all, in that sense, related. Uh, we've got the questions on COVID in particular relating to the schools. And then we've got, obviously, the questions on the Ukraine. And, uh, and so I do want to try and ensure that as, uh, as many of the questions are addressed. Uh, so Tim Lan asks, it's never clever to declare wars. Uh, the people don't need, nor do they want war. Unfortunately, the ones in charge are brain dead. Uh, Roman, uh, Roman then uh, asks or makes a statement, that's why I'm shocked that this group, meaning the SEP and the IYSSE, is so opposed in supporting the defence of Ukraine from Russian imperialism. Now, all these questions are really very important. Um, and we do want to, to create the conditions as much as possible to, to answer them. There is a, a question for uh, Gregor. What have German students said about the Greens who joined Parliament in 98 with flowers in their hair and now wear a steel helmet supporting German imperialism in this war? And then there's a, 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 a question, does Russia stand alone? What will the, situa what will the situation be? Does Russia, is Russia going to stop? So he wants to show his power. Um, I'm presuming that you mean Putin. So before we, uh, we answer those, and, uh, and obviously all the, the uh, contributors are more than um, welcome to, to participate and answer any of the questions. Um, but before, and we'll, I'll just go to the, to the literature and, uh, and uh, give our speakers some time to, to uh, get their thoughts together. But I think that the, um, the two books that we have showing today, I think are very appropriate and important. Um, a Quarter Century of War was uh, a book which we compiled, which, uh, which Mehring Books compiled of predominantly the uh, articles, essays, uh, lectures um, produced by uh, Comrade David North, who is the uh, chairman of the uh, International Editorial Board of the World Socialist website and of the SEP in, in the United States. And what it outlines mm -hmm. is the uh, period from 1990 to 2016, which of course was the, and 1990 was the, the beginning of the um, uh, intervention into the Middle East, in particular Iraq, uh, Afghanistan, which then spanned, as the, the title of the book outlines, 
uh, 25 years of non-ending war uh, by the United States in the attempt uh, to re-establish its global hegemony, which, uh, which it was attempting to do militarily um, uh, and, and to establish its, uh, it, its dominance once again. Um, with the uh, which it had lost economically, and so I think, I mean, this is a Marxist analysis of of this war drive, which of course was bound up certainly with the the collapse of the the uh, Berlin Wall, uh, the reunification of Germany, um, and then the uh, dissolution of the Soviet Union. That was seen by the United States as a, a, a green light to undertake all its military uh, designs and perspectives, which it had had to somewhat uh, rein in, uh, and that's a relative uh, characterization, um, but which then unleashed with the dissolution of the Soviet Union. Uh, that, that book is $30, its, uh, its EPUB is $13, um, and it's it's a very very important uh, book to uh, to establish and, and have in your library. The other book is the book that uh, that Gregor referred to, Christo, uh, Christoph von Dreyer's Why Are They Back? This book was was uh, written and published in 2019, and it highlights the uh, certainly the the uh, development in which the, the Nazis uh, came to power. This was not uh, the result of an election. It was also um, not the result of, in that sense, uh, mass struggles of the working class. The working class had been rendered uh, incapable of really responding to the, to the Nazi threat because of the policies of the German Communist Party, the KPD, which, whose policies in fact divided the German working class um, and uh, prevented them from unifying with it, their social democratic uh, brothers and sisters in the common enemy, which was the Nazi party and, uh, and the, the coming to power of, of Hitler. For that reason, Hitler was able to uh, ascend the, the, the uh, chancellorship. He was invited by uh, Hindenburg and was able to literally walk into, into the position without a shot being fired. And uh, the fact that now you have within the German state, certainly representatives within uh, academia, within layers of, of the right-wing intelligentsia that have re-emerged again uh, is bound up with the, the crisis of, of German imperialism and the very real threats which, <clears throat> which confront the, the working class, not just in Germany, but internationally. And it has only been the International Committee and the SGP that have fought to highlight this, uh, this, this danger to, and, and to mobilise the working class on the basis of a socialist perspective and in opposition uh, to these layers that are now being uh, promoted by the media, uh, uh, by the, many of the political parties within within Germany, and uh, and also by uh, sections of the of the ruling class. Uh, the, the book is twenty dollars, and it is a very very important, very accessible book. And I would certainly urge you to um, uh, to to buy this book. Um, with, with that, I would open up now for our um, for answers. I think uh, Evram wants to address one of the uh, questions which have been raised, um, and then we can we can uh, go on from there. Yeah, thanks, Cheryl. Um, I think uh, you know, as you said, all of the sort of questions are interrelated, and um, while there are many different um, issues. I thought um, it would be good to touch on um, a couple of them and then uh, let others speak. Um, but the, the issue of, I think, where war emerges from um, 
is something that that needs to be considered and touched upon because um you know we we don't think that it emerges from the sort of psychology or um the intentions of individual leaders you know psychotic as they may be um i think you know it'd be wrong to sort of see the um the current situation or any developing uh or development of militarism as the result of not being clever or um yeah leaders being brain dead i think in relation to this uh it's worth looking back at the causes of the previous world wars i mean more and more the situation uh today resembles the period that led up to both the first world war and the second world war um and so you know reviewing these historical experiences um has direct relevance for our analysis of contemporary events um and for the first world war roughly speaking there are two con contending positions uh, on the one hand you have the position of an analysis of marxism and on the other you have um the position that's put forward in various forms of bourgeois liberal um you know uh writings um the marxist analysis is that the war emerged um as uh um as the outcome of conflicts rooted in the objective and irresolvable contradiction uh contradictions within the capitalist mode of production particularly between the global um character of the economy and the nation state system in which the uh, profit system is grounded now the opposing theories boil down to the conception that the the first world war emerged out of uh political mistakes or miscalculations or misjudgments of various bourgeois politicians and could therefore have somehow been averted if they were more clever or if they you know been wiser and the reason i bring this up is because there are very definite political um conclusions that are drawn out from these two opposing positions uh because if the marxist analysis is correct which we believe it is then what immediately flows from it is that you can't end war without um without ending the capitalist profit system itself and creating you know a new socialist system um so the the other position that's put forward has a very definite political purpose it is to um you know prevent the working class and young people from understanding the real objective causes of war and to put forward this idea as i was saying before that um that if only calmer wiser heads prevailed then you could prevent war um as uh, as trotsky um said in the transitional program of the fourth international which is the founding document of our world party um you know the bourgeoisie sees no way out of it, it toboggans with eyes closed towards it um and that's why you know we're, we're stressing that what's required is the overthrow of the system which leads to it so i think that um it's important to make that distinction we don't sort of think that you know had uh, an individual capitalist politician been wiser or had you replaced one capitalist politician with another uh, you could prevent the current situation uh, thanks Evram uh, Oscar will um, address the question on mm -hmm. uh, do we uh, so we don't support Ukraine or or do we support Ukraine um, which I think is a very it is a very important um, question and and one that was that's it's important to answer sorry uh thanks Cheryl I think it's a really critical question I mean this is the universal line from the political and media establishment uh really in all of the imperialist countries including here Russia's the aggressor aggressor Ukrainian sovereignty is under attack uh so you have to support Ukraine stand with Ukraine um etc and anyone who differs with that um, will either be excluded from media coverage uh, denounced as you know a Russian agent or subjected to other attacks I think first of all you know not to belabor the point was raised in in my report but I mean what is 
uh, democracy in Ukraine. It's a very important article by Peter Schwartz, uh, the secretary of, of our World Party and a leading member from Germany. It's called Democracy in Ukraine. What is NATO risking a war for? Um, and he goes through uh, just what this post-2014 Ukrainian government oversees, um, the promotion of the war criminals in Ukraine who collaborated with the Nazis, including in the mass murder of uh, Jews, Roma, uh, Poles and others, uh, the integration now of, of these fascist militias directly into the Ukrainian uh, military. And as with all of these, you know, Eastern European countries resulting from the breakup of the Soviet Union, uh, politics is dominated by, you know, wars between of, of utterly corrupt rival factions of, of oligarchs, um, Ukrainian society. I mean, you just have immense social inequality. He cites an average monthly income of just 412 uh, euros. But I think uh, even since the, the conflict has begun, I mean, we've seen what this Ukrainian democracy is. Uh, the leadership of the main parliamentary opposition party is either under arrest or fleeing for their lives. Um, members of, of the Communist Party, leaders of the Communist Party are under arrest. We published an article uh, yesterday about a anti-war um, mixed martial arts fighter who's being held by these fascist groups, uh, tortured with videos of it posted on the internet. Um, so that's this much vaunted democracy in Ukraine. But I think the, the fundamental point is that supporting Ukraine um, means supporting the US NATO war drive uh, against Russia, which didn't begin a couple of weeks ago. This is a decades long project. It is aimed at dismembering Russia, ensuring the dominance of uh, US imperialism in Eurasia. And it's a program that will lead to um, world war. I think one of the, the, the critical issue that we're raising is the need for the working class to uh, take up an independent standpoint um, in opposition to all of the governments, a standpoint that's based on an understanding of where this war came from, the historical issues uh, and how to fight it. Um, the, the perspective of lining up with, you know, any government uh, in a war crisis uh, is a perspective of subordinating the working class to, to the capitalist class uh, and ensuring fratricidal conflict. Um, I mean, the only way forward is the unity of, of Russian and Ukrainian workers in particular, but workers more broadly on the basis of a socialist program. Uh, otherwise, what's the perspective? Um, you know, support the Ukrainian state um, into a, a thermonuclear war that will threaten the very future of, of humanity. Uh, that's the perspective that's being discussed each day by governments, political leaders, uh, including here. It's an expression, as, as Evram said, um, of the utter bankruptcy of capitalism. I mean, this is a system that has nothing uh, to offer the working class, the world's population, uh, except the prospect of, of ever greater catastrophes. And it's up to the working class intervening uh, independently based on its own class interests to prevent that. Thanks, Oscar. So um, we've now got uh, Nick Beams, who, the former National Secretary of the SEP, uh, who's in the um, audience and who would also like to address a couple of the, the questions. So if we can unmute Nick. Okay, a, a question was raised. So should we just let Russia annex Ukraine? Now, I'd like to take this question up from a couple of standpoints. Firstly, we don't approach this conflict, this crisis, from the standpoint of this nation, that nation, and so on because the nations themselves are divided. Fundamentally, there are two classes, the working class and the capitalist class of different forms. But that's a fundamental division. So our starting point is not the nation. It's the working class globally, this global social force, which we fight to integrate and provide with a unified program common to all countries, whatever country they live in the unification of the working class across national borders and divisions. Once you adopt the national position, 
the adherence to the nation state, uh, you have immediately split and divide the working class. So our standpoint is the working class as a unified social force. And we take out, make our appreciation of politics from that standpoint. Now, we are absolutely opposed, therefore, to the actions of Putin from this standpoint. It's firstly reactionary. It sows great confusion among workers all over the world. Uh, it provides the ideological basis, the grist to the imperialist war machine. Uh, and it's inimical to the interests of the Russian working class, the Ukrainian working class and the international working class. So we are absolutely opposed to it. But not from the standpoint of US imperialism. We oppose it from the standpoint of the interests of the working class. And that is, it's fundamental to grasp that difference. I think, as we said, in one perspective, we have to learn how to fight imperialism on the one hand without capitulating to Russian nationalism. And we have to fight Russian nationalism on the other hand without capitulating to imperialism. That can only be done to the independent actions of the working class. Having said that, then we come to the question of, well, why is Putin invaded? Now, you can search up and down the main so-called mainstream media for an explanation, you won't find it. Putin is mad. He's crazy. He has ambitions. He wants to do this, that, and the other thing. And we've heard all this before. I mean, Saddam Hussein was the new Hitler. So was Slobodan Milosevic in Yugoslavia. So was Muammar Gaddafi, uh, so, et cetera, et cetera. It explains nothing. What we have to understand is why, was, why did Putin take this desperate gamble and this measure? Well, that requires looking at the whole situation, what has happened with the expansion of NATO. In 1990, and it's now very clearly documented in the public record, Gorbachev, as he, Mikhail Gorbachev, as he's presiding over the liquidation of the Soviet Union, was given definite guarantees by Hans Dietrich Genscher, the German foreign minister, by James Baker, the US Secretary of State, and others, there would be no eastward expansion of NATO after the unification of Germany and, and the bringing down of the uh, old uh, Warsaw Pact. Not one inch expansion. That was the words Baker used. Now, of course, we know what took place. In 1998, the US Congress passed uh, a, a bill uh, saying that NATO could expand. The former uh, foreign policy advisor, George F. Kennan, warned that this was going to lead to a conflict with Russia. 1999, a whole series of expansions were started. And one can see uh, that further outlined in the excellent webinar we had two weeks ago. I would urge people to have a look at it. So Putin, and very much this intensification of this uh, orientation to bring these countries into NATO to develop a wedge against the Russia was developed after 2014 and the fascist backed Maidan coup. Then we had the intervention in, uh, of, of uh, Russia in the Crimea, uh, uh, Donetsk, Lugansk, and, and so on. We had the Minsk Accords of 2015, which were supposed to try and make a resolution of that conflict. And uh, Zelensky, Zelensky did actually engage in some discussions about that in 2019. Very interesting. What happened in October, the fascist organisations organised demonstrations against him, told him he was going soft on Russia. In other words, there was a threat hanging over him that uh, if he continued on this course, tried to make a settlement, he would go the same way uh, as the president in the coup of 2014. So this is the background. Now, to make an explanation, I want to emphasize this point because it's often misunderstood. To provide an explanation of what has taken place does not mean a justification of what has taken place. We seek to provide an explanation, an analysis of the forces of imperialism at work in this situation to provide an orientation to the working class not a justification for Putin, but what must American workers do, Australian workers do, British workers do. They have to oppose 
the plans of their own ruling class. And there was a very interesting, and how does that affect the situation in Russia? How to stop Putin? Putin can only be stopped by the Russian working class. There was a very interesting comment in the, uh, yesterday or the day before, conversation with a Russian worker published on the uh, World Socialist website. And our Russian correspondent made the point that if there was a genuine anti-war movement in the West, in America, Britain, Australia, elsewhere, this would immeasurably strengthen the Russian working class in its fight against the reactionary Putin regime. That's our perspective. And this is not just a question of unification, or the last point I'll make, unification for unification's sake and so on. No, it's on a definite perspective. The only way out of this crisis is the return to the perspective on which the Russian revolution was fought in 1917. Because the crisis is the dissolution, finally, the final dissolution of the USSR has produced this crisis. Workers have to turn back to this program that was carried out, which, among many, many other things, provided a unique and creative solution to national problems in Eastern Europe that have been developing throughout the 19th century. In the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, that was a very creative solution fought for, and particularly by Lenin and by Trotsky, and actually opposed by Stalin. It's very significant that Putin's long speech he gave as he launched this operation was directed to an attack on Lenin and the formation of the USSR. Uh, and Lenin's last struggle was a, a struggle against this great Russian chauvinism, nationalism, bullying, and so on. So that's the issue not the turn to imperialist powers, one side or the other, but the turn to the working class and the renewal and development, uh, expansion of the program on which uh, the Russian and Ukrainian working class made such a powerful step forward for humanity in the October Revolution of 1917. That's the road to which we have to return. Thanks, Nick. That was, I think, very helpful. Um... Look, I, I'm, I'm moving along quite quickly because we do have a lot to cover and, uh, uh, and I know there's other speakers who want to speak, but uh, Gregor would like to answer some of the questions that have come up and also the ones that specifically pertain to the situation in Germany. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Cheryl. Um, I would like to support what has been already said by comrades uh, Nick Beams and Oscar. Um, speaking of Russia and Ukraine, in a certain sense, is something of an abstraction, um, as they are um, split among uh, in, in rivaling classes and uh, fiercely opposed uh, classes with um, diametrically opposed interests. And um, I think the contributions of Oscar and Nick have um, very well um, outlined what uh, we fight for. We defend first and foremost uh, the international interests of the working class. And I would like to just make a point about um, the question of the Greens that was raised because it um, gives the opportuni opportunity to draw some lessons um, from uh, the intervention and war against uh, former Yugoslavia and the bombing um, of Belgrade. Um, the Greens rely on privileged sections of the upper middle class and today are the foremost re representatives of what can be called human rights imperialism. But that doesn't mean that they are not prepared to violate human rights. So during the last um, coalition government of Social Democrats and Greens in the 90s, um, when they first joined the government, um, the Greens organized the first German foreign military intervention since the Second World War, um, the bombing of Yugoslavia. This is what we wrote um, in a perspective by Joseph Kishor. Um, Yugoslavia had been already devastated six decades earlier by Hitler's Wehrmacht, and now um, it was uh, the Greens and the Social Democrats who led um, the Western armies back to this country. 
So the Greens have never been a workers' movement. They were always based on the middle class and on an explicit rejection of Marxism and the revolutionary role of the ruling class. But what has happened, and this pertains to um, current events in the upper middle class, uh, there's a very, um, yeah, very hysteric um, war propaganda that is being um, supported by the middle class. Um, I already tried to make some points about that in my um, introductory remarks. But what has happened is that um, some of these social strata um, have enriched themselves following the globalization of capitalist production and the dissolution of the Soviet Union and have shifted to the right accordingly. And now um, they um, are the chief promoters of, of war. So um, concerning Yugoslavia, both Biden and Blinken uh, played a major role um, in that time already. Um, and if we want to discuss the question whether um, defend Ukraine or what what is the character, the reactionary character of Ukrainian capitalism and the class character of the state? Um, I think it's important to um, uh, to consider the following points, which I want to quote. The process of dismantling Yugoslavia began in December 1991, concurrent with the dissolution of the USSR with Germany's unilateral recognition of the independence of Slovenia and Croatia. This was followed in April 1992 by the Bush administration's recognition of Bosnia-Herzegovina as an independent nation meriting its own state. The moves by German and US imperialism to recognize the independent states in Yugoslavia fomented bloody national conflicts throughout the 1990s, including the Croatian War of 1995. So even though it was the imperialist powers who first drew the national lines anew in Europe um, after the dissolution of the Soviet Union, today the imperialists uh, argue and claim that uh, any um, support given uh, to uh, um, uh, to separatism um, in Eastern Ukraine uh, constitutes um, an unacceptable breach of, um, uh, of international law. When in fact, um, it was the NATO powers who already in the 90s uh, breached and violated uh, international law and uh, yeah, bombed uh, entire cities. We wrote, um, or Joseph Comrade Joseph Kishore wrote, the catastrophe stoked by the US and NATO powers was used in 1999 to justify direct military intervention, waving the banner of humanitarianism, eagerly supported by layers of the upper middle class and academia. The Clinton administration launched its war against Serbia to enforce the secession of the province of Kosovo. It was accompanied by all sorts of claims of human rights violations that were ultimately demonstrated to be grossly exaggerated. Um, and this, the same thing is taking place on a much higher level today. Um, today, it's uh, the flag of, um, uh, of a national sovereignty of Ukraine, which must not, uh, under any circumstances, be breached. And um, uh, under that flag, it is uh, supposedly um, acceptable to fund and uh, arm right-wing extremist uh, militias that have carried out uh, mass uh, crimes against uh, the population of Ukraine. So um, even the, the regime in Kiev, uh, one could argue that it uh, has been carrying out uh, what amounts to a war on, the, on their own population. So um, what is currently taking place has nothing to do with um, uh, protecting workers uh, and youth in Ukraine. On the contrary, they are being used as pawns for um, NATO aggression against Russia and uh, as pawns in the great power play 
um, and their aims of regime change and um, breaking up of, of Russia. So Joseph writes, uh, the war was carried out by NATO, which did not obtain a resolution from the United Nations and was therefore acting in direct violation of international law. It culminated in the installation of a government in Kosovo run by the Kosovo Liberation Army, which, which the United States has previously designated as a terrorist organization and which would subsequently be exposed for engaging in drug running, prostitution and the trafficking in human organs. So this is the kind of perspective that Western imperialism has for Ukraine after uh, their intervention. So first and foremost, what we defend is um, the interests of the international working class and we fight um, against nationalism and for um, and against imperialism. Yeah. Thanks, Gregor. Um, I think I think we have uh, Comrade Mike who wants to make a comment as well. Okay, there are several questions about the pandemic and uh, whether masks are now required in schools and universities and a suggestion that perhaps the pandemic wasn't serious in New South Wales. Just very briefly, I'll try to clarify those questions. Um, a pandemic is a epidemic of infectious diseases that has, a, that has spread uh, around large parts of the world, or in this case, globally, and that uh, affects uh, you know, substantial sections of the population rather than just localized uh, fleeting uh, cases, which you could classify as endemic, a word which has been completely misused by the authorities. Um, we're now in fact confronting the next wave of this pandemic on a global scale, which is the Omicron BA2 uh, mutation, which has now taken hold disastrously in Hong Kong, uh, but is now spreading everywhere. Uh, as we reported on the World Socialist website in Australia, we have last week some idea that about 24% of all cases are now Omicron BA2. But of course, these figures are very unreliable because the testing and sequencing has not been conducted. In Australia last week, as we reported, there were 200,000, more than 200,000 cases, up 20%. Uh, in a week and the New South Wales government itself has warned that this will double within the next uh, month. And of course, despite that, governments are in fact winding back all precautions, including mask wearing. In New South Wales, and it's pretty much the same in all the states now, no masks are required anywhere uh, except on public transport. Masks are not required in schools or universities. Classes therefore must be held without masks. And this is already giving rise to enormous uh, infection outbreaks. We know, even though this is being hidden as much as possible, that there are large clusters now occurring in schools and significant numbers of schools are having to shut down despite governments directing the departments to keep the schools open at any cost. In the universities, we know at ANU uh, last week, nearly 700 students were infected before classes even began. Um, now, I, I was just looking at the latest announcement from Prime Minister Morrison. He is seeking to justify or demand support for the lifting of even quarantine requirements for close contacts because he says otherwise it will starve businesses of staff. And this is not sustainable as the pandemic enters a new phase. Well, how, how much clearer could you make it? The requirements of profit to, to force workers back into workplaces, even when they're close contacts or potentially infectious, must be, uh, must be carried out. And of course, the trade unions are entirely uh, in support of this. Now, just one final point. You know, the, we've been told by governments and their apologists that children can't be so seriously infected. And that's why you know, schools can reopen. We know that even young children are not vaccinated at all. Well, there's increasing evidence, you know, of course, that children are seriously affected. 
and and uh, some have died in Australia as they have internationally. And we we're learning more about long COVID that this is a a terrible disease which affects many organs and will affect people for life um, in many cases. So I just think, you know, we should not, um, and there's a connection between this and the war. Uh, the war is a, has arisen not least out of the tremendous uh, breakdown and crisis produced by this pandemic, which government for which governments are entirely responsible, giving rise to enormous discontent and unrest and war is a, seen as a, a, a diversion from that. And of course, the other connection is that who are the victims of war and the victims of the pandemic? It is the working class, uh, not, not the wealthy. Um, so I'll just make those points. Uh, I hope that clarifies some of the questions. Thanks, Mike. No, that was, that was good. Um, we also have a question. Um, for Gregor asking if uh, you could comment on the campaign being conducted in Germany to rehabilitate the Nazis and Hitler, which I think is important, particularly in light of the fact that another of our uh, participants has um, asked and you know, exclaimed that, that they didn't know that that was taking place, which of course is entirely uh, valid because it never, it, it is never, uh, reported here, it's never discussed. In fact, very little about Germany is uh, is raised here. So your answer to that, I think, will be very enlightening for our audience. Well, um, yeah, there's certainly um, a campaign to rehabilitate um, the Nazis and um, especially to whitewash uh, German uh, crimes in two world wars. Um, this is the content of the book uh, that I just unfortunately was able to mention in passing. Um, why are they back? And um, it is the product, this book is the product of um, the struggle of the IYSSE at the universities in Germany to oppose this campaign of um, historical falsification and of, um, yeah, uh, historical whitewash. Um, so what is, for example, being um, promoted, um, I'm referring here to a professor of um, Eastern European history um, called Jörg Babarowski, uh, is for example, that the war of extermination in the Soviet Union uh, was the product uh, not of the aims and needs of German imperialism, uh, not even the product of um, uh, of the intense and um, insane anti-Semitism and um, nationalism um, stoked by the Nazi government. No, it was, uh, according to this Professor Babrowski, um, the pro uh, product of um, the way in which uh, the Red Army uh, conducted war, um, defensive war. Um, against the um, Nazi armies, which invaded the Soviet Union. Um, as I mentioned, uh, an invasion that led to the death of 27 million um, Soviet citizens, um, and a crime that um, has been unparalleled um, in basically uh, the entire um, history of, of conflict. Um, and uh, the these um, statements, uh, it's, this is not the only thing. I mean, um, Mr. Bawarovsky has also been quoted as saying that um, Hitler didn't want to know anything about Auschwitz, uh, which is just uh, not the case. Hitler was even um, demanding uh, video material um, produced in uh, the concentration camps, uh, produced uh, depicting um, uh, um, depicting um, murders of, of um, prisoners of war and so on. So this is just flat out wrong and uh, s statements like these and um, professors uh, like these um, are um, supported by the German government. We had important articles um, uh, reporting that, uh, for example, the 
former um, of the Ministry of um, Education back then um, went uh, on display uh, supporting um, everything uh, that uh, Mr. Bobrovsky uh, represents and declaring that um, there must not be uh, any criticism of such um, standpoints. And I mean, if uh, in Germany, criticism of um, such, uh, such statements, for example, that Hitler was not vicious or that he didn't want to know about the Holocaust or um, that the war of extermination was forced upon the Nazis by the Soviet Union. I mean, if those statements can't be criticized, then not only is um, uh, free speech um, just a plain lie, um, no, then in that case, uh, the, the same crimes could be possible again uh, in modern day times. I mean, uh, nobody should um, underestimate um, the dangers uh, that are, um, are contained in the present uh, situation. And um, if, uh, if the bourgeoisie is um, led to, I mean, if, if, if the bourgeoisie is not impeded and um, removed from power, uh, then there's no limit um, of unspeakable crimes um, that uh, this system is able to produce. Um, but what we um, what we saw in our campaign as we um, exposed these kind of questions and explained them to workers and youth was that um, there's immense latent um, and not 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 so latent. <laughs> Uh, opposition against uh, um, against a return of any such uh, crimes and perspectives among uh, workers and youth. And what they're really looking for um, is a tenable and serious and scientific perspective um, against capitalism, against war, um, against the threat of fascist dictatorship, which is uh, has been um, intensified during the pandemic. I mean, you have uh, mainstream uh, politicians now declaring that you have to um, kill off the weakest uh, uh, people in uh, society to um, pr protect profits. I mean, this is Nazi politics and this is becoming mainstream. So um, there's huge opposition to that and um, interest in our Marxist uh, scientific perspective is growing and um, people are beginning to take up the fight um, for socialism and for the organization and independent uh, mobilization of the international working class. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, Gregor. Look, we are, I'm afraid, running out of time. Um, but I think, uh, look, I think the, the question that was raised in regards to <clears throat> the issues that arose around uh, <clears throat> Joe Biden's son, uh, Hunter Biden, um, and, you know, what relationship they had to the, the developments which are now taking place, and which I think is a very insightful question, actually, and it's an important one. And very, very quickly, um, I mean, the, the allegations in regards to Hunter Biden were that, in essence, he had used uh, his father's uh, contacts, relationships, uh, you know, his uh, uh, standing in, in the Democratic Party, the fact that he had been the vice president um, under Obama to, to develop business uh, deals and relationships in China and also in, importantly in Ukraine. In fact, the, the revelations in regards to Hunter Biden became the trigger for impeachment, uh, the, the, the first impeachment uh, measures against uh, Trump. And in that sense, this was the first time that uh, a sitting president had been impeached on the basis that he was 
a, a threat to national security. Um, and it, it's very significant because Trump wasn't impeached because of his fascist politics, not because of his attacks on immigrant workers, uh, not because you know he was building a wall to ensure that that those fleeing persecution and economic deprivation uh, did not get into the United States. Um, he didn't. He he wasn't impeached because of the attack against the American working class, their conditions, uh, but because he was too soft on Russia, and in particular because he had withheld finances, I think it was something like $390 billion uh, to, to um, funding to Ukraine. And, and, and so he was impeached on that basis. The impeachment failed, um, but it was, I think, as we outlined, as the World Socialist uh, website outlined, was in fact, the working out, the differences, not strategic differences. There were no strategic differences between the Democrats and the, and the Republicans. There was no issue that workers had to be exploited and, and uh, driven. The productivity levels of the American working class had to be uh, heightened. Uh, there was no difference about the necessity of US imperialism uh, to launch preemptive uh, and aggressive wars against other countries. There were no differences about the necessity of US imperialism to re-establish its hegemony. It was a tactical difference between different sections of the ruling class as, as expressed and represented between the Democratic Party and the Republican Party about how those uh, that strategy had to be adopted. In that sense, uh, Trump's orientation was, was against China and against uh, and to deal with the, the economic prowess and, and rise and growth of China. Whereas the Democrats felt that in order to take on China, that Russia had to be neutralized. It had to be, uh, in that sense, uh, defeated in one form or other. Um, and so the, the issue, particularly pertaining to the Ukraine um, and, and funding to, to Ukraine, uh, was bound up with those uh, strategic tasks uh, about which there were tactical differences. And, um, and so the, the uh, uh, allegations in regards to, to Hunter Biden, uh, this, this privileged, um, uh, you know, useless individual um, who made millions of money uh, and, and, and dollars both in, in China but, but particularly within, within Ukraine. I mean, uh, Biden had been accused of, in, you know, intervening to prevent uh, prosecutions against one of uh, his son's companies in Ukraine. Um, and so all this was, was part of the working out of the bourgeoisie uh, expressed between the Democrats and the Republicans on how best to proceed. And so the fact that, that when Biden came to power, his initial decisions were to withdraw troops from Afghanistan, which was of course done in the most uh, uh, you know, uh, haphazard way um, in really a, a crisis because clearly what was being demanded is that all the resources necessary for US imperialism had to be uh, regrouped and allocated in particular against Russia. And one has to say that had Hillary Clinton uh, been victorious in the 2016 election, then this, this war, what, what's being carried out now, would have in fact been carried out much earlier under, under her uh, auspices. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, the, the, the fact that, that Trump uh, 
ha has developed fascist forces, undertaken measures, uh, you know, to to create the conditions for for presidential dictatorship, then orchestrated the January six. Um, uh, invasion of, of the Capitol building and the over the attempted overturning of uh, the 2020 election. None of that is, is of a principal character for the Democratic Party. The issue for them was the necessity to be able to take on Russia, to defeat it, to dismember it, to plunder it, um, and to, to reduce it to a vassal state. So I think that the question is actually very important. Um, I think Nick wants to answer one other question, and then I think we will have to move on, I'm afraid. I'll try and be very quick. The question was raised on Russian imperialism and also <clears throat> Chinese imperialism. Imperialism is one of these words today that just gets thrown around without examination of its scientific content. Of course, it has a hurt certain history. We refer to the imperialism of the Roman Empire. We could refer to the imperialism of uh, feudal states in the past, uh, and so on. But in the modern context, it has a very, at least as developed and defined by the Marxist movement, the socialist movement, it has a very precise content. It refers to the situation that developed at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. It was clear that fundamental changes were taking place in the structure of world capitalism. Uh, there was not the competitive capitalism of the 19th century. Huge banks, industrial corporations had developed, which had huge international influence. And Lenin in particular, in the, and many others, uh, we had the book by uh, Rudolf Hilferdink, 1910, Finance Capital, but Lenin made a particular study of imperialism. This was an imperialist war, a conflict between great powers for the domination of the world. And in defining imperialism, he made a very central point. That is the domination of finance capital, this new phenomenon. Now let's take the situation just briefly, Russia and China. Joe Biden got up the other day, the president and said, the Russian ruble is worth less than one cent. That's true. That's the domination of US finance capital over Russia. The Reserves of the Russian central bank, $630 billion, which it's built up through the sales of oil and gas in particular, are now frozen. It's as if you put money in the bank, $1,000 or something, you think it's an asset, and the bank says, no, I'm not going to let you spend that on anything. So it's reduced to zero. That's what's happened to the Russian central bank, the central bank of the 12th largest economy in the world. The same situation applies to China. They have $3.23 trillion, I think, worth of treasury bonds and other financial assets. That can be wiped out overnight. Now, and they are called imperialist powers by the pseudo-lefts. It's complete nonsense. Complete nonsense. Imperialism is the domination of finance capital. And uh, that's above all in the hands of the historically developed major powers, Britain, France, Germany, United States, and so on. Now, just one, you know, what, why is the confusion arise? Because the term is used to uh, describe the military actions of capitalist states as imperialism. Well, in that case, every, it has no meaning because every capitalist state becomes imperialist because every state uses in one way or another, even the smallest ones, military power to try and advance its own independent interests. So this is absolute economic nonsense, but just the last point, it has a very real political content. It's aimed to confuse, disorient, uh, create, you know, among, create the, among impressionable uh, sections of the population and so on, this, uh, this idea that they really have to line up uh, behind uh, their own ruling class against Russian imperialism, against Chinese imperialism and so on. So it's economic, historical nonsense, but like so much of we see today, it serves a definite political purpose. Look, I'd, I'd like to uh, um, continue this discussion, but I think we will have to, to bring uh, the proceedings to a close. Before I do, 
I would like to uh, appeal to everybody here to donate uh, to the monthly fund of the SEP. Every month, and we have been doing this now for 50 years, uh, our party is um, in next month, 50 years of age, and every month we have uh, raised a monthly fund. That fund is designed and required to provide us with the resources to carry through the political work that is necessary for us to, to carry through the, the fight for the building of the International Committee and its section in this, in this area and, and within this region. And so I would very much ask that uh, you, you donate as generously as you can. You are the only source of finances that we, we get. We don't get it from anywhere else, not from the state, not from sponsorship, not from companies. We get it from the working class. And so your donations will be very, very, uh, very appreciated. While you're doing that, I just want to bring your attention very quickly to our two other books that we want to uh, draw your attention to. And that they are the uh, pamphlets, Socialism and the Fight Against War. This pamphlet was produced in 2016 and is the statements of the International Committee of the Fourth International against the drive to war, which uh, was, was certainly accelerating uh, in that period, particularly, and again, it was bound up with, with provocations uh, in, in Ukraine, but was predominantly bound up with the fight and the war against terror, which was used as the mechanism for the uh, invasions of Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, uh, uh, Libya, and the destruction of those, of those um, uh, societies. The, the, uh, this was, uh, I think, as I raised in regards to the quarter century of war, bound up with the necessity of US imperialism to militar militarily try to reapprise its uh, he lost hegemony. And so this, uh, this pamphlet, which is $5, is, is a compilation of two statements, actually, one from 2014 and one from 2016, but for which we don't have to change one word, not a word. Um, and the fight is for the international unification of the working class and for an anti-war movement. And the other one, which is also $5, is the Socialist Equality Party's Statement of Principles. And this is a summation. This is a condensation in that sense of the, the political perspective and program of our movement. And we, we urge you to read this, this document because agreement with the political program of this document is basis for membership. And that is the, the other issue that I want to raise with you. I think as, as uh, our, our party has fought for, particularly over the past year, uh, we have raised the issue of uh, the deregistration of our movement um, from the, of the Socialist Equality Party as a, as a political party, which may, and we have now been deregistered by the AEC. This was bound up with the attempt to prevent non-parliamentary parties from standing in the election um, under our own name. The reason being is because there is enormous fear which exists within the political establishment that neither the Liberal uh, coalition governments of Morrison uh, or of Labor um, will be able to, to attract and win a large enough majority to rule in the um, following the election in May, if in fact such an election takes place. Um, I know we have said before that the, the, the next election is a crisis election, and, and it, it has been true, but none like this. I mean, already there are uh, 
rumours and preparations by uh, Liberal MPs to unseat Morrison. And whether that's successful, whether it's not, of course, it will resolve nothing and it will change nothing in regards to the program of the government. But so too will the situation be in regards to Labor. As Albanese, the, the leader of the Labor Party, has boasted, there is no daylight between us and the Liberal uh, government on the question of national security. And there's not. They are just as warmongering. They are just as demanding of war against China and supporting the US uh, alliance um, in, in the, the war against, uh, against Russia. There is no daylight between Labor and the Liberals in regards to the attitude to the working class, the drive to productivity, the demands for the increase um, of, of uh, profit levels for business. There is no daylight between Labor and the, the coalition on the question of the pandemic. Both have supported the complete ditching of all restrictions that, that were successful in stopping the spread of the virus. The fact that there are thousands and thousands of people who have died, five, more than 5,500 people who have died, most of them this year, is because of the policies mm -hmm. of the National Cabinet, of which Labor is the, the primary uh, participants. And so our, our um, election campaign, which we will hold, whether we can do it under our own name, which we can't now because we've been deregistered um, or not, will be bound up with the fight to present a political perspective, an alternative uh, opposition to the uh, po political parties of all the other um, organisations which, are, which we are fighting for a socialist perspective, a socialist program. And it is only through the building of an alternative political perspective, the, uh, and the, the World Party of Socialist Revolution, that all the issues which confront mankind, whether it's here in Germany, in the United States, everywhere, can be addressed. Ordinary people have to take matters into their own hands. Ordinary people have to now uh, develop and build independent rank and file committees, neighbourhood com committees, uh, committees that did what they did in L Lismore, but do it on, on a permanent basis and do it in an organised uh, sense and, and with, with co uh, co collaboration, um, uh, discussion and, uh, and relationships with, with other uh, of these independent committees throughout the country and internationally. And so on that basis, I certainly uh, call for you, if you agree with our perspective, if you agree with our program, then join. There can be no other more important uh, task which you do than to stand with the fight for the construction of uh, a world party, the Inter Inter uh, International Committee of the Fourth International, um, to fight for the overthrow of capitalism and the establishment of a socialist society. Outside of that, uh, capitalism will find a way. It will find a way. Uh, to resolve its problems, and it will be at the expense of the working class internationally. And so with that, I would thank you very much for your participation, for your contributions, for your questions, your comments. They are extremely welcome. Um, and I hope that you have been clarified. I hope that you, you come back to our um, other meetings which we will hold um, soon, both here and also internationally, but most importantly to, um, to make your, your, or to take your, your stand with the, uh, with the International Committee. But again, thank you for your attendance and, uh, and for your participation. Take care.